switch gears here a little bit and talk about the, the visual arts. Um, I uh, normally, my research more broadly focuses on this intersection between Cuban and Cuban American art. Um, I'm also very interested in issues of transnationalism, what's happening, uh, what are visual artists that have um, come to Miami post-1980, or let's say 1989 specifically, that have spent you know, 20 years here. Um, you know, are those Cuban Americans? Are they, how, how do they self-identify? What is it about their work that's different from their Cuban American counterparts? So some of those are the uh, questions that I've been asking in my research. But for today's panel, I'm going to specifically talk about second generation Cuban Americans. Um, it is a body of work in a group of artists who in some sense get kind of um, uh, ignored from the sort of broader uh, literature on Cuban art. Um, the existing scholarship on Cuban art either has focused um, solely on the contemporary practices of artists on the island. There's a very strong um, contemporary art scene there. There's a very strong market for it. Or um, the scholarship has focused on the earlier revivals, uh, the 60s and the 70s, um, I'm going to talk about a little bit as a sort of historical framework, but then I'm going to go into talking specifically about a group of artists um, and then end with a project that looks at these sort of transnational relationships uh, in which a, a lot of these artists that we talk about participated. So, um, to start out with, um, I'm going to talk about this artist. Um, well, I'm going to talk about the generation very briefly that came in the 60s and 70s. Um, Umberto Vesa, for example, probably a lot of you uh, know who he is. Um, came in the late 60s or early 60s, but is part of a generation of artists uh, that we refer to as the Miami generation. This is the first group of Cuban, um, with the one and a halfers who came here uh, in, as young adults. Uh, but this is the first group of artists from Miami uh, who make themselves, who develop a, a, a professional careers as artists. So, Marta Besada is. Uh, I use him not just because of the rigor of his work, but because he's a representative of that sort of exile uh, aesthetics, if you will. His work, um, as you will see here, references um, you know, pre-revolution architecture. There's a sort of um, idealization of the past. And um, like the artists I'm talking about, I'm going to talk about now as well, sort of mines the past in order to reconstruct his um, identity, right? So he's looking at archi through architecture, he's going to imbue this kind of nostalgia. And for a long time, this, this was sort of the narrative of Cuban-American exile art. Uh, the next uh, work is from the uh, early 90s, and here you see that that same kind of architecture is now being deconstructed. So some time has passed, um, and there's this uh, sort of sense of, you know, of loss and of architecture literally being fragmented. Of course, we can use that as a symbolism for his own sense of, of, uh, of identity and also his relationship again to his past. It becomes increasingly fragmented as, as we go along. Um, the next artist that I want to talk about is uh, Maria Martinez Cañas, who uh, is not technically part of the Miami Generation group, but uh, like Humberto looks to the past. It's, she's mining history, in this case, uh, on, the, on this figure that we're looking at, um, the image on the left is a series of historical uh, Cuban stamps that her family owned. And she recreates um, a work based on the sort of you know, general outline of this work um, through her photographic process. Now, her process is really interesting because she is literally reconstructing um, this work from collaged pieces of negatives. So she, you know, the work that you see here, if you were to look at the negative, it's this large piece that has been put together by um, different materials, but primarily negatives, that then she reconstructs to create uh, this particular image. In this case, it's again uh, referencing a historical image uh, that her family owns. 
in, in the next image of totems, she is specifically referencing the work of a Cuban modernist of Lam, who um, imbued his work with a lot of Afro-Cuban symbols. He was the first modernist artist to do this. And uh, again, Maki Hispanias is paying homage to Lam as she uh, reconstructs uh, her own identity through her work. Uh, so again, it's, it's looking at history, it's looking at the past in order to understand um, you know, her sense of identity. This is fairly common, um, I think also in, in literature, but in the visual arts of what we, what we think about uh, normally as the American art. Um, but the, the, the group that I would focus on a little bit more in detail now is uh, the second, literally the second generation. So these are artists whose uh, parents came in the 60s and 70s and who grew up in Miami in the 80s. Um, they're probably very in their early 30s or 40s now. Um, and I've identified some shared characteristics. Um, one of the things that um, actually differentiates them from the, from the artists that I just talked about is that they're English dominant. Um, they obviously grew up in, in Miami. And their work is um, informed by American popular culture just as much as it is informed by the sort of Cuban vernacular that they learn from home, at home. Uh, in this case, um, these artists that I'm talking about now um, have a language of quiche, of, of, of irony, of satire in their work that actually directly references their uh, bicultural identity. Luis Gisbert is the first person I'll talk about. Um, he was born in New Jersey, grew up in Miami, now lives in New York. And most all of these artists that I'm, talk, I'm going to talk about, by the way, have very successful careers. Um, he was part of the Whitney Biennial. He's represented in New York by a very prestigious gallery. Um, in this case, however, this is a work from uh, the early 2000s, Living Room from the series Urban Mist. And here we see um, I'm going to make an image, but he's recreated this sort of tableau uh, that really pokes fun at uh, you know the Cuban American. Aesthetic, or you know, exaggeration, if you will. We have the uh, sort of exaggeration of the Spanish, um, you know, attire that his her, his uh, his uh, aunt is wearing, and then the two sort of rambunctious kids, uh, the Dianas, who uh, you know flank the, the figure, and of course, uh, you can't miss the two Pisanera portraits in the back, and you know these exaggerated bosses uh, on either end. So this is a this is a work that we did that again recreates this um, you know I think a, a setting at home that is very familiar to this to this generation. The next uh, the next two images are a little a little earlier actually, and um, they take the image you know or the trope of the cheerleader. In this case, the cheerleader is not blonde. Uh, she's not wholesome. In fact, uh, you know she's like. A, ethnic cheerleader, and she's decked out in this kind of bling bling, uh, you know, uh, wardrobe, if you will. And the one on the right uh, is also part of the series he did on cars. Uh, his later work, I don't have to this now, but he uh, also has a huge body of work that references, uh, you know, Miami's deep uh, car culture. Here you can see it a little bit, this is a little more recent, and um, this is the interior of, you know, sort of a fictional of a car that's decked out in um, you know, designer um, brands, and then we see two steps in the landscape, juxtaposing the two very different realities here. Um, the next artist that I want to talk about is Bert Rodriguez, similar um, background, um, grew up in Miami, a few of parents, and um, now lives in LA. Um, in Bert's case, there's humor, there's irony as well. Um, and in this case, he's sort of poking fun at a historical or a sort of figure, military figure. Um, but you can't take him too seriously because you can see sort of the development of his facial expressions. So it's an art that, while uh, you can read, you know, sort of some sort of political, um, you know, meaning in there, uh, you can't take him too seriously. And the next work is um, a wall I built with my father in 2008. So it's literally a wall uh, that he built with his father. And this goes you know, into another characteristic that I wanted to uh, bring up in addition to humor and irony is you know, post-Cold 
plus conceptual approach to their work. So we are seeing here that we're getting away from this narrative, from figuration, and um, you know, artists of this generation are dialoguing with trends that are you know, more broadly associated with, with contemporary art and being a sort of a national and international uh, scale. So um, this is a volume of his father, which of course has a lot of familial implications, if you will. The next piece, um, I would say the counterpoint to this, and it's a meal I made with my mother. This is an installation um, from an exhibition we had in Paris. And uh, what remains in the show is what you see on the left, which are sort of the utensils and like the setup of, of what that process entailed. The uh, image on the right is the actual performance. And here, Bert is um, also, in addition to, you know, specifically alluding to the role of his mother in his life with how, uh, you know, important, you know, these kind of like family uh, home cooked meals are, um, Cubans, uh, there's also a broader um, sort of narrative that's taking place here, and that is uh, something called relational aesthetics. So Bert is able through this work to kind of ride those two you know, domains of Cuban and American, and at the same time, you know, as perform his, his role as an international artist. In this other piece, uh, this is a piece that he did at the Whitney Biennial. Uh, for those of you who are not from the art world, it, this is a um, an exhibition that takes place uh, in two years, and it's a very prestigious, you know, if you make it to a living by the you're pretty much uh, set. And um, for this, Bert created um, this sort of little room where the visitors were invited to go in, and he was, he acted as a therapist. They were telling his, you know, troubles. What they didn't know was that they were being broadcasted to the rest of the museum. Um, only this kid was sort of in Kind of way, but um, you know, sort of uh, breaking down the barriers between the private and the public um, sphere. The next artist I want to talk about is Beatriz Montelaro, who uh, doesn't actually get a lot of attention, but I think, sorry, I think her work. Uh, she's also from this generation. She was born in Cuba, raised in Miami, uh, but her work has this sort of punk aesthetic. She's actually part of a. She's a musician. Uh, she's part of a punk, punk band, she's a drummer, and she's also a visual artist. Um, I'm going to show her earlier work later, actually, because I wanted to start with this very recent uh, installation, um, which was inspired by the sale of her uh, childhood home in Miami. And in that process, she came uh, into contact with you know, all these kind of knickknacks from Christmas decorations, which you know some people, some families in Miami get really, really over the top. And so this is sort of Beatrice's uh, kind of punk interpretation of a Cuban Christmas, Christmas decoration. Uh, in the next slide, you see you know, sort of the baby, and um, and then you know the poor and other you know the animal being sacrificed on top, um, and you know again the colors, the coloration is also kind of you know off. It's not the kind of happy. Cheerful Christmas that you, you would normally attribute. Um, and then uh, this more kind of uh, violent image is um, these are actually old photographs that she found as she was going through um, you know, her parents' things during the sale of, of the home, um, which I think is a really interesting exhibition of this kind of you know, speaker on the left, and this very kind of matada image. By the way, this whole series is called the um, a little bit more of her, this is her earlier work, and here you get to see sort of the origins of this, um, you know, funky aesthetic, um, you know, kind of acerbic in her, uh, her approach to figuration and to narrative. Uh, and also, you know, a very talented uh, craftsman, if you will. Again, based also in some popular culture, you know, uh, finding names. Then we move into post minimalism or what I call spatial reimaginings, um, which in this case are at sort of the opposite end of the kind of architectural reimaginings, if you will, that we saw in the uh, presentation. Um, this is Teresita Fernandez, who's also a very well known Cuban American artist. Uh, she now lives in New York. Um, I believe she graduated from FIU. And, um, so she, she does know 
for her use of unorthodox materials and uh, you know, visually stunning works uh, that recite at the intersection of landscape, architecture, and materiality. Here we see some of her more recent work. Um, again, you know, a very kind of post-minimalist um, approach to installation in which both the idea and but also this uh, preoccupation with aesthetics is important. Um, in, in Teresita's case, um, this does, you know, her work does not have uh, social or political implications. In fact, what she wants is for the material and the way in which she arranges these materials to create a different kind of perceptual and psychological uh, sort of experience in the new work. Uh, she just recently went back to Cuba or returned to Cuba after obviously never being there before. Um, so I think it would be interesting to see the kind of work that um, she'll do after that experience. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more. Um, this is a work from 2011. Again, it shows the, um, you know, the different materials that she uses in her work. And again, in this kind of post-minimalist and conceptual visual approach. Um, lastly, we have Lady Rodriguez Casanova, who uh, actually is the only one from this group that was born in Cuba. He came here through the Mariel boat lift. He was six years old. Um, and unlike Teresita, his, his work, although he shares that sort of post-minimalist and, and conceptual approach to his work, uh, the materials that he uses do have a very, so, a very direct social implication. And his, you know, what, what Lady wants to um, sort of bring across in his work is his working class uh, background. His father was a handyman and an electrician, and these are the sort of types of materials that he grew up around. Um, on the image on the left is an homage to his father, who's now since passed, and it's the floor plan of the bedroom, um, of his father's bedroom, um, which he recreated in this linoleum, um, which is very typical of uh, my own homes. The image on the right is a, you know, just regular old lamp that by inverting it, he's kind of giving the, that object a you know, symbolic and artistic charge. In this case, uh, you know, it's a commentary again on the plethora of rejas that we see all over Miami. Um, not only is it sort of neatly its own thing as an object, but it's making, I think, a uh, very direct social, uh, you know, commentary on, on this sort of like Cuban exile aesthetic. And I wanted to um, end with you know, what, even though I've done a lot of research on, on this topic, I didn't want to uh, dwell on it too much, but Cuban artists are now, Cuban artists, Cuban American artists who have grown up here, like with artists who I have talked about, are now beginning to go back to Cuba. And um, Cuban artists from Havana are coming to Miami. And so this sort of flow that's taking place is generating, uh, you know, new languages, new collaboratives, sort of, uh, visual languages among artists, but in this case, Leiden, whose work we see here again, this is one piece that is shown in Havana uh, before actually he returned to Cuba, which he did last year. Um, the image on this image is by Leo Perez, who also, who also lives, uh, who grew up in Miami, but now lives in Brooklyn, and he's another artist, Cuban-American artist, who has recently returned to Cuba. In this case, uh, he was invited to paint this mural done by the uh, as part of this citywide public art uh, project called Detrás del Muro, which is also part of, of the Havana Biennial. And um, these, you know, these, these artists are doing something very significant because it's not very uh, characteristic of this generation to uh, be that involved with Cuba, at least not at this point. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention on that note is that I um, have, in the last year, taken this group of artists to Cuba during the biennial, and um, it is going to be interesting again to see what what that does to their, you know, what what kinds of new sort of artistic practices um, they'll kind of be inspired by from from that experience. In this case, we see in the case of Leiden and in New York that it's already sort of 
uh, and you know, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about the implications of that project. Thank you so much for the invitation to come here to the center. Um, I'm going to talk about another generation of Cuban Americans, and this is the first generation, but not in the traditional sense of the you know exile, traditional exile uh, first generation, but a first generation of Cubans who migrated since the 90s to Miami, um, but not only the U.S to Miami, New York, but up to Europe, Latin America, etc. Um, these are Cubans born and raised during the revolution um, who were born in the late 60s, early 70s, um, who you know, got their education basically in Cuba. So this is basically, and specifically, I'm going to refer to the music, uh, music network of transnational collaborations of, of music production that is taking place across different cities of the world, with, you know, protagonized by Cuban musicians. Since the early 90s, a group of singers, songwriters, students, and bohemians began to interact in informal gatherings, payments on the island like Teatro Studio, Trece y Ocho, y El Rio Almendares. These bands and music gatherings map out an important space for an alternative cultural landscapes in the 90s Cuba. From diverse and mostly self-trained musical background, these musicians began updating the legacy from the Nueva and Novissima Trova with multiple music references common to the generational music, musical universe in the island, such as Tropicalist Brazilian harmonies and rhythms from musicians like Yavan, Chico Huarque, Gal Costa, Caetano Veloso, Argentinian rock, grunge, pop, funk, reggae, and army. In addition, the generation of singers and songwriters were more inclined to introduce dance forms based on rap, funk, and Afro Cuban rhythms. In the other hand, a group of academically trained musicians forms band like Yemayas, Estado de Animo, and Columna Bay, where they began experimenting with fusions between their own academic background and other music genres with a marked jazz base. These musicians were particularly inspired by the important tradition of fusion between music and jazz, particularly the border in the island, 
va el Chucho Valdés, Mira Keren, el grupo de experimentación sonora, Emiliano Salvador, and Gonzalo Rubalcaba, among others. Through copies and hand-to-hand -hand circulation of recordings and video cassettes brought by those who were able to travel abroad, these musicians intensively listen and study a wide spectrum of American jazz musicians from more traditional to experimental. The level of musicianship from American folk bands and pop superstars, as well as to Brazilian music and Argentinian rock, also particularly attracted them, like their singers and singer-songwriter cohorts. Many academically trained musicians either joined, helped create, or were invited to participate in the accompanying bands of more and more traditional exiles that emerged since the end of the 80s. They propose alternative of this topic this, sorry, of more established singers and writers of the time in the island, like Silvia Rodriguez, Pablo Milanes, Santiago Filiu, Carlos Valera, and Xiomara Lampar. That system of collaboration has been crucial in the professionalization of the sound recording of Cuban singers and songwriters, and has persisted as a common feature in the music production of the uh, transnational Cuban alternative music scene throughout the world. Studies about the 90s Cuban music field focus mainly on popular music made in the island, like timba, on the impact of global trends in the local music context through genres like rap and hip hop, and more recently, reggaeton, and on the insertion of Cuban music in global circuits through world music with the Buena Vista Social Club phenomenon. Despite what De La Noise calls the significant transterritoriality of the Cuban culture that took place since that period, Scholarship of Cuban music scenes in diaspora since the 90s is scarce. That gap could be attributed to the global dispersion of these musicians, their relatively limited visibility in either mainstream or world music markets, and on their apparent low profile political narratives on Cuban issues in comparison with previous diasporic waves. However, this globally spread out and prolific music diasporic network is an important archive for the studies of important changes in the Cuban imaginary since the 90s crisis in the island. The significant shift experienced by the Cuban society resulting from the 90s crisis marked a moment of rupture, of an ongoing process of the construction of the revolutionary nation through cultural narratives, but in different ways than in previous days. I argue that as a result of the 90s crisis, alternative and transnational narrative spaces emerge in the cultural production from the massive diasporic network of Cuban singers and writers and academically trained musicians. These narrative spaces deepen the, the, the process of the construction of dominant narratives about Los Cubano, stemming from the official discourse in the island and among traditional excise that emerges day and day. The proposed alternative they propose, I argue, alternative, dystopian, and transnational approaches to imagine, listen, and represent Cubanists in a post-Soviet context. In the music field, the 90s massive way of migration to the United States, Europe, and Latin America mark a distinct moment in the transnational experience of Cuban music, with the most significant reallocation of Cuban singers, songwriters, like Emma Corredera, Pablo Urquiza, and the members of Habana Abierta, and as well as academically trained musicians like Dustin Prieto, Josvani Terry, Alain Perez and the Semer Bueno, among others, also born and raised during the revolution. One of the singers and writers of this generation, based in Madrid and now in Mexico, who also has uh, written about this uh, generation of uh, musicians, indicates that, his name is Julio Forle, indicates that in their lyrics, some of these musicians were voicing an increased discontentment with the effects of the economic crisis the uncertainties and constraints of the national project for young people and the lack of space for diverging opinions. This lack of space and support to develop their art on the island, as well as the devastating effects of the crisis, led many of these musicians to migrate. Most of them left the, left the island at the beginning of their careers and suddenly became migrants with little knowledge of how to operate in the global music market. They faced a dramatic transition moving from the paralyzing paternalism of a subsidized socialist economy to the different challenges and uncertainties of the capitalist world, especially in terms for first-generation migrants. Those musicians have formed what I call the transnational Cuban alternative music scene, a network of collaborations, 
production and consumption of Cuban music across different world cities like Miami, New York, and Madrid. Tracing mainly local and international non-mainstream music circuits, this transnational network was prompted by greater mobility acquired by these musicians as migrants, their better access to recording and communication technological developments, and the advantages of instant socialization and marketing opportunities provided by social networks. In the transnational context, communication and professional collaborations among Cuban musicians throughout different countries, including with those in the island, is another distinct feature of how music is made and produced in this network. In an interconnected global context, these musicians have been able to share music, jointly compose, collaborate, and produce virtually across different cities around the globe. Examples of these collaborations are reflected in USA's initial recordings as a soloist. She chooses Pablo Luquiza at the time based in Madrid, the Semer Bueno based between Miami and Havana, and Robertico Darcasez based in Havana as music pro producers for her first album. These three musicians have been also leading pro producers of a good deal of this network music in the last 20, 20 years throughout different countries, <coughs> including the island. In most of her recordings, Yusa has also invited Cuban musicians from this generation living in different parts of the world, including members of the Havana-based band Interactivo. Yusa is based in Argentina, or she travels between Argentina and Cuba, but is based now. Yusa was also part of the album Arben B from Hema and Babel, recorded between Havana, New York, and Madrid. These diasporic musicians open up the aesthetic boundaries of Cuban diasporic music production beyond the dramatic nostalgia for the homeland, or traditional commercial stereotypes of Cuban music that still prevail internationally. An eclectic fusion with world sonorities is their main musical language, where the archive of Cuban traditional songs and more eclectic popular Cuban music is in open to a counterpointing dialogue with world sonorities. This Cuban fusion doesn't fit easily into traditionally recognized Cuban music genres in world music, Latin, or international mainstream markets. The music of duo Gemma y Pablo is an example. They were among the first singers and writers from this generation that migrated to Madrid, and their prolific career as musicians and producers became an important reference for many Cuban musicians inside and outside the island. Although informed by La Nueva and Novissima Trova, Gemma y Pablo proposed a new type of Cuban song. They recreated the tradition of trilling boleros in a very creative counterpoint with Brazilian harmonies, Andean songs, Afro-Cuban rhythms, jazz improvisations, and flamenco, resulting in a sophisticated vocal and music arrangement. Most of the recordings, collaborations, and productions for this generation of cohorts were produced on a transnational fashion that I referred before throughout different cities of the world, which is a distinct feature of this diasporic network. The music of Cuban jazz musicians from the 90s 